So what made you decide you wanted to get into the entertainment industry? Um, because I was actually kind of a shy kid. My mother and I used to watch horror movies. I mean, anything that was on, like my favorite person was Susan Hayward and Betty Davis, but she also let me watch horror movies. And <laughs> I don't know why, I didn't even, would even say to her, what did she let me watch that for? Like the birds, she let me watch the birds when I was a little kid. So, um, um, and from there, I, but it, it wasn't just watching the movies, it was because it made her, movies made her happy. And I just, it made a strong impression. I just want to see my mother happy. And so it kind of, I just want to see everybody happy. <laughs> and films do tend to have that uh, ability. Well, it's just, you can just tell that they're connect people are connecting with them and their faces soften and you can tell that they're, that it's, they're interacting and it's making them feel something and opening your heart and connecting with other people, which is, you know, we don't do enough of, I don't think. And it's just beautiful. So, I can't think of anything else better to do. Right. Um, it leads me to a question I was going to ask a little later, but what was it about the 80s that really allowed itself to give us such classics in both comedy and horror? Well, we didn't know this at the time, but <laughs> um, it, was, it was different than it is now with all the remakes and reimaginings and stuff. Everybody was out to do, do something that that, that nobody else had ever done. It was like, where do my friends see this? They're gonna pass out. Nobody's ever done this before. And it was all about being unique. And they would outdo each other. You know, it's like the, the Michael mask was, you know, $5 and it was a, Ca a Captain Kirk mask. And those kind of things like jazzed us up. It's like, look what I got, three bucks. You know, that looks real. And we, it was just sort of renegade kind of, um, like we thought it was low budget, but it's not low budget for, for these days. Um, you know, we thought a quick shoot was three weeks. Haha, <laughs> it's a, it's no longer that way. But uh, for the time, and um, um, what else would be different about it? Um, there was just a freedom about things. It's, we had the audacity. It's like we'll do. We just sort of had attitude. Like we're gonna do whatever we want and see if it turns out cool. And you know. So let's talk about uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High a little bit. How did you get that role? I auditioned for it. Actually, I, I, I auditioned for um, Stacy Jennifer Jason Lee's role in New York. And I got all the way up there and we did all these, um, we read through the whole script. And Phoebe, Phoebe Cates and Brian Backer were there with me in New York. And Phoebe said, um, we're dead and this is actor's purgatory. And we're just going to have to keep, <laughs> they ordered us lunch, and we, I don't know how many times we did the, and then I didn't get the part. Um, and I found out later, they always had Jennifer Jason Lee in mind, she was already out in Los Angeles, and, um, but they called me up and they said, do you want to play the earlier? <coughs> and up until then, I'd only played juvenile delinquents and a psycho killer. So I thought, cheerleader, are you kidding? <coughs> and I, to this day, I think, okay, so on the East Coast, I'm a psycho killer and, and you know a juvenile delinquent, and in Los Angeles, I'm a cheerleader. What does that say about those coasts? You know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. right. So um um, and that's that's how I, I got. It was my first time in California, and I walked on the lot. It was Universal, and it was it was beyond anything I could have imagined, because I came up with Teamsters because um, I didn't drive and. So I was there at the crack of dawn way before everybody else and I got to see the, the lights coming up and the trucks coming in and then the wardrobe coming in and, and it come to, but just like you, just like it was in a movie, you just see it all come to life and I couldn't believe I was there. It was everything that, I, that you would imagine it's gonna be, it was. So talk a little bit about working with an ensemble cast like that. Um, you know, a lot of younger actors not get what they, you know, we know them as today. But could you tell some were on their way to going to, you know, bigger spots, the A-listers? And also with that, <clears throat> when you're working in an ensemble cast, I always wonder, is there competition? Is that drive to make for a better performance? Or are you, are you trying to outdo each other? Oh, no. Um, we, do we do inspire each other. Um, the, the greatest way to step up your game is to work with a good actor because you tend, the other actor tends to rise to the level, if some actor is really bringing it, it's gonna make everybody else better. 
Um, so it wasn't so much competition, but we were all serious as a heart attack about what we were doing. Um, there was like no shenanigans. It was not like, oh, let's make a high school movie. Uh -uh. We were all serious. And um, everybody had done stuff before. I just, I had a feeling about when I walked on the set, they were shooting the, um, the scene where Brad um, comes in with the cruising vessel. And I went, the cruising vessel. And the producer turned around and went, who said that? There was enthusiasm. <laughs> it was me, so then I, you know, looking back years later, that's why they cast me as the cheerleader. I didn't get it at the time, but... Mm. So they saw something, like, way before I saw it. Um, um, but I th we all thought it was something. And it's our ages, too, it's like, you know, everything we, we do is important, you know, when, when you're young, and, and so maybe that was just it. But, uh, how old were you? Um, I was 17. But I'd already been on soap opera and stuff like that. And I, I was <laughs> in New York, I could drink, and then in Los Angeles, they busted me right and left. I think it was like, I don't know if it was 18 or 21, but nevertheless, I might have been 21 at the time. And I was so enraged, because in New York, I was treated as an adult. And here, they treated me like a kid. I mean, Los Angeles, they treated me like a kid. Hated it. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, in light of the comment, uh, you fought zombies and a sinister group of scientists. Talk about filming that movie. And it seems though, you know, this would be a more physical shoot for you. Talk a little bit about more of the physical aspects of shooting. Um, it didn't really strike me as, as uh, super physical at the time. Um, I guess it was. I guess it was. Um, I don't recall ever, like, you know what was physical? More physical was chopping mall and the zero boys. That was con constant running. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think what I did that was super physical and none of the comet. I don't know. Oh, shooting the guns. Well, they took us out and taught us how to shoot on real Mach 10s. So, and so everybody laughs at me to this day because I always do that like little plant. Um, but that's what really happened because those guns are heavy as hell. And you don't just like wing it off and like shoot it. They're super heavy, and, and if you're not really, really grounded like that, it will knock you off your own feet. So that's why I did that, and everyone thinks it's funny, but it, it, <laughs> I was trying to be, like, you know, great, real. Great plan. Yeah. Great plan. Were they black pistols? Pardon? Were they black pistols? Um, they were rubber. Oh, okay. Which sometimes, you, I, I don't know, I don't know. So. We're working, we're both working on one right now that, uh, um, it's as real as that, though. We got guns that uh, they shoot blanks. They don't shoot anything actually yeah. at the person, but they, they go off and uh, they're loud. We had one guy say he was holding straight out, 45 auto, and he put it shot about five, six times. I mean, he was damn, it's loud. <laughs> yeah, oh, they're super loud. They're super loud. And all the guys on the, the comic, every time there was, they'd run around and, like all excited and go, fire in the hole! And they'd bring in the real guns, and it was like, you know, they were royalty, and they'd hand them to us, so we could use the real gun, and we had to be really careful. And then everything, everything would go to hell, and they'd squib, I don't know if you know what squibs is, it's like a little gunpowder thing, and they shoot it, it goes off, and it looks like a bullet. And the guys were so excited to see that, they all came running, it was just like it was a nude scene. Like, all of a sudden, everybody has to, finds a reason to be on set. But it was just... I didn't really realize, I guess, I, the first time I ever really saw it, how much guys like guns. I didn't really know that. <laughs> so, uh, when your gun jammed, I heard you improvised the line. They jammed the whole thing. There were several lines in that movie that are because the guns jammed. Yeah. Because uh, they used Mach 10s to save money. Tom Everhart, the writer-director, wanted Uzis. Yeah. And so, and he was very angry. He said, do you know what this is gonna do to our shooting schedule every time we turn around? they're going to jam. And so all those lines, like when Kathy says, you know, this might be okay for a date night on the barrio, but, um, and when I say, that, when I say that's a problem with these things, Daddy, meaning Tom Everhart, would have gotten us Uzi's. Because it was like, it, it was particularly horrible that day. But it happened all the time. <laughs> what would you have preferred? Uzi's would have made that better? I think it's I think it's great the way it turned out, actually. <laughs> I mean, it would have been like less dramatic if, if they worked perfectly all the time. It was kind of fitting. 
So I, I read a rumor that you actually kept one of the uh, cheerleading outfits. There were two. One of them because actually I must be I, more. I must have been more physical than I remember being because it was case one got messed up. You know, so we had two of everything. I got to keep one, and Tom Everhart's daughter got one, and she used to go as me for Halloween. <laughs> I mean, that was a kid. I don't know if anybody knew who she was. But um, then, so I had this, this uniform for a long, long time, and then um, I finally sold it to a private collector who says, you know, anytime you want this back, you can have it back for what I bought it for. And I thought, that, that's okay, but you know, you wanted it, so you can have it, you know, but... Um, Sometimes, and you know what, there, there's a thing like, it's like whatever happened to Baby Jane. If somebody says, oh, can you wear it in, in this picture? It just feels crummy to me, like, whatever happened to Baby Jane, you know? <laughs> like, I'm a mature woman now. I don't wear it around in a cheerleading outfit. It looks stupid. And some people have trouble separating the characters. I know, I know. I feel sometimes like people are disappointed when they meet me because they think I'm going to be Samantha. And then I come in, and I'm Samantha's mom. <laughs> and, you know, and I just really kind of, even, even people in the business, yeah, I can just say, they want, they want that, that moment in time, because it some, means something to them in their life, too. And that's what they think of when they think of you. And um, so, it, I mean, it's been very hard for me to come back as my own age, because everybody, Th thinks of me as that kid because I did like boom 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 in a row. So, and and then also, um, um, they don't know what to make of me now, you know, because that's what they always think of. It took me a long time to break out of that, and now I'm playing, you know, uh, alcoholic cougars and moms, and it's, <laughs> and you know, but um, and and all, and some psychos. So, um, but um, it took a while. Well, I'm glad you finally you. found your way. Thank you. Well, I mean, one time I had to drive all the way across Los Angeles, and I get there, and she says, I just wanted to meet you. You're in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I'm like, <laughs> you just wanted to meet me? <laughs> and then Robert Romanus, who played, you know, he said the same thing, that it happened to him a bunch, too. Really? Yeah. No, it's, it's not. Actually, it's not, because it's, it's, it's very flattering to think that it means so much to people that... But I've been in LA traffic. Oh yeah, it's, it's your whole day. <laughs> Did you say that would be three hundred bucks? <laughs> I should have. I should. Have. I had no idea. You know, otherwise I probably would have. Um, I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have gone and meet them anyway. Right. So at the beginning of Night of the Comet, uh, when your uh, mother slapped your character, uh -huh. I, I read that she actually slapped you. I told her to. She didn't want to, and she really didn't. It was, you know, because she was scared to hurt me. But I was on the soap, and I had an um, adversarial relationship with my mom. The woman who played my, you know, the characters hated each other. And so we would be there, and, it, and time was going by, and time was going by, and they, you know, sort of try to make us fake hit each other, and it looked so stupid. And I remember saying, just hit me, Louise, then we can go home. And, and she said, really? And I said, yeah. And so, and it didn't hurt or anything, but we got the shot and we got to go home. And so, we were not getting that shot because Sharon didn't want to hurt me. And I finally just just hit me, Sharon, then we can go home. Because we got the shot. It doesn't, you know. And then I threw myself over the couch. You know what, you're right, I did do some physicals. <laughs> then, then I don't remember right away, but yeah. Uh, so let's uh, talk about working with Catherine a little bit. Uh, it seemed like you guys knew each other forever. I know. And how does that work with actors? Like, I'm sure you guys just met each other, here's the script. Yep. But on the screen, it just seems like you are those characters. How does that work with the chemistry? I think it's like either past life stuff, or it's, there's something crazy about it, because we never, they never saw us together until the first day of shooting. And it was kind of like, I got there, and Kathy got there, and um, we just um, ran lines once, and then we just started working. And it was weird. It was just, it's, you know, movie, that's what's so cool about the movies. It's such a drug because it's like magic. And if you can capture it in a bottle, you'd make a fortune, but you never know what's going to happen. You have all the money in the world, the best cast in the world, the best script, and it falls flat somehow. And then on the other hand, sometimes two actors walk in and they're, they're like, the chemistry is like, so. there's no rhyme or reason to it. You can't plan that. 
and it just sort of happened. And even I think everybody was astonished by that too. But Kathy and I weren't really surprised. No, no that's why I think it's a past life thing. It's like I'm like, oh yeah, hi, we agreed to do this before. <laughs> Because we're still friends too. Yeah. Are you? Mm -hmm. That's great. And me and Barbara Crampton are still friends. Speaking of Barbara Crampton, let's move to uh, Chopping Mall. Um, one thing I was curious about in that film, yeah. I, I was I, I was born in 1980, so I, I kind of missed the 80s in that way. But were there a lot of parties where people would be watching TV and then also having sex in the same room? Not in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, now that I never thought of that before. Gosh, just they were right behind us having sex. Like everybody was, except you two. But they were, you're right, they were right behind us. You run a mattress store. This is, okay, this is why these are fun, because it doesn't matter how many times somebody asks you questions, you're going to remember, or something's going to hit you that never hit you before. We're in the same room as those people, and we're not even, we're just like, da 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 da, -da. this is a scary movie. <laughs> Oh my God! Just always it's right behind us. <laughs> oh no! And we didn't even play it. Well, it didn't seem like it. It seemed like they were far away. And then, plus, they shot those scenes at another time. So when Tony and I shot our stuff, we were alone. Yeah. And gotcha. oh, jeez. <laughs> but we do at least acknowledge that that they're having sex. So I've interviewed a lot of actors that have worked with mechanical animatronics, mm -hmm. and it always seems to be a nightmare. What, was, were the kill bots a nightmare as well? Yep. <laughs> what was the worst thing that happened? Well, one of them is, but dude, first of all, they're not fast. So I'd have to fake run. And fortunately for me, I already had to fake run on the Zero Boys because if you if you go too fast, the DP is on the dollar or something, and he will hate you and want you dead. And so I learned how to fake run. And it's a good thing because that's all I did in chopping all this fake run. Because it got to look like you're really booking, but the robot is not be. I mean, there's no way this thing's going to catch you. And then there's really only one that, I mean, one, thi one thing the hand worked, and one thing the head worked, and one thing, you know, you could move around on a remote control, and it was always messing up. Um, but I think there, I, one thing that I can't believe is there's no shot of me and the killbot together. And no, Jim can't believe it either. It's like, how did that even happen? We've got one group shot where I sort of have my arm around it, but it's like one of those little Polaroid things. How did that even happen? Right? I'm so upset about that. I've seen that movie a hundred times and I never realized that. Yeah, and if you look through them, because I did, yeah, people were looking through to see, well, that can't be. There's a, you know, nope. Oh. I know. I know. So you mentioned Jim. What, what was it like working with him? Um, well, Jim, Jim's a character, okay? And um, he, he's a Leo, and all of his movies are about him. So, and it's all about, you know, yelling and, you know, um, he's got little catchphrases. And, and if, you, if, you, if you're a certain type of, of temperament, he can make you cry. Um, on Chopping Mall, the crew let the air out of his tires. <laughs> So a lot of people were not amused by his antics. Um, I always got along with him fine. You just, if, as long as you're prepared and you have a sense of humor, um, you know, and you're used to being growing up in an abusive environment, <laughs> you're fine. And um, he could be really fun, but he freaks out if something, and he, and he decides something's not working too soon. <laughs> he starts screaming, Where's, you know, this one woman said one time in a different movie, she goes, because it was a, a day play or something, she was supposed to come in, and, and it wasn't her turn to come in yet, it wasn't her, but he didn't see her. And he starts, where is she, where is she? And she's right there, and she goes, he's like a little kid. You know, if he, if he, can't, if he, if he can't see it, it's not there. <laughs> so he just jumped the gun a lot. Right. So it's pretty much his way or the highway? Oh, definitely. All the way, all the way. But you know, as long as as long as you know that going in, right? It's not a surprise. No. <clears throat> Is he one of the tougher directors that you worked with? Um, Nico Lasteracas was a dick. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wasn't. You know what? That's not that's not true. Because he was very Greek and had a very it was a clash of cultures, 
And I didn't like the way he was, I, I don't know, I, I, he was, I thought he was disrespectful. And, and so I took umbrage with that. And I should have just, you know, kissed his butt and gotten out of there. But no, I'm a kid and I have a smart mouth and I think I know everything. And so we didn't, you know, he just rubbed me the wrong way because, um, and I'm sure I rubbed him the wrong way too. So um, that was hard for me. That was hard for me. Um, but it's okay now. But he, uh, he got in touch with me and he said, um, why don't I deliver one copy of the Zero Boys to you in person? And I already, you know, I asked for a box of DVDs and they'd already given them to me. I was like, that's okay. <laughs> and he said, he said, you know, I, I don't know why you think that I didn't like you. That's not even true. I'm sure he didn't even remember any of it. You know, it was a big deal to me because I was, you know, a kid and stuff. But younger than he, and um, he probably doesn't remember it. But it was the first time I ever really felt like, I don't feel like we're on the same wavelength here, you know, normally you deliberately get into the groove. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was the toughest. Who was your favorite? Um, Tom, probably. I did two movies with Tom Everhart. First, um, then The Comet, and then n- nobody really saw this one, but it's my favorite role I ever did. It's called um, Face Down, and I play a schizophrenic. And he told me, he, he said, I just... Something was going wrong with Captain Ron, and you know, because it's all the suits are there, and they all start telling you what to do, and he's getting very frustrated. So I just walked away for a second, and all of a sudden, I you started talking to me, and I just started writing down what you're saying. I said, and you came up with a schizophrenic. <laughs> if it's made sense somehow, you know, people would say, was that hard? And I go, it was the easiest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a few technical things. Like he said to me one time, he goes, um, um, there was Mary and Meredith. And he said, Meredith never smiles. And I knew exactly what he meant. That's all he had to say. So um, that was probably my favorite one. But nobody saw it. It was like Showtime, I think. Everybody go out and check that film. You can't. They never made a Blu-ray. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. no. It's oh, just wow. it's Joe Montaigne and me, Adam Ant, and um, Peter um, Riegert. That's yeah. true. Hopefully it'll get a release one day. I don't know. Not I mean, too. I haven't, but... <laughs> so talk about in shopping mall filming in the actual mall. Was it a, when you went in the in the evening when it was closed? How, how did that? Oh happen? yeah, well in shopping mall they didn't shut the mall down for us. So um, we would wait for the stores to close. We would get in there. It was like guerrilla stuff. We would set up and we'd shoot as fast as we can, and then we'd have to have everything back where it was for the stores to open. So that ideally they didn't even know we were there. And you know, meanwhile, we're, we're shooting up the joint, and things are breaking all over the place. And the, everybody had to—I mean, the actors didn't have to do it, but everybody involved would have to replace things the way it was. And we had this pole, and we actually—we actually—it was a marble pole, and we actually took a chunk out of it. And they were, you know, I mean, we set somebody on fire in that mall, you know. And then it's like nothing happened here. Um, but fortunately for us, the guy who owned the Galleria was a huge movie buff, and that's why you'll see so many movies in the Galleria. And that was, he was a mensch. Well, that was, you wouldn't, we wouldn't have gotten that, but he just loved the movies. So were you on set when they did the head explosion scene? Yes. <clears throat> how was that, that was... how did that go? I mean, oh, watching. again, all the guys were so excited about <laughs> Susie Slater's head's gonna explode. You know, and it was disgusting. It was like all sorts of um, gross stuff. And you know, we were all really behind that window, really watching it happen. And um, um, she had to run from far away, so Jim would go, Susie, can you hear me? And she would say, no. And then he'd die laughing because <laughs> I knew what she meant. She, no, she can't hear him to, to know what he wants her to do. Um, and then it went, it just exploded. I don't even know how to describe it. It's, I mean, we weren't standing behind the, the, the window when it exploded, but um, it was it was something else. I don't even know what to say about it. It was disgusting. Awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. How about when you blew up the paint store? Oh, yeah. Uh, was that, I know something outside that happened. That, that's actually Roger Corman's studio in Venice uh, for the paint store. Yeah. Um, it, and um, 
that had nothing to do with the, the, the real mall. Mm -hmm. um, we used his studio and and we busted it up too, but I was the studio, so it's okay. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, did you do any of your stunt, own stunts? And did everything except for I didn't break the glass because they didn't want me to get cut, and because um, I I wanted to do it, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and Jim said I won't make you do anything I won't do. So like with the spiders and the snakes and this, then it came to a scorpion, and they dropped it in his lap, and he went, okay, she doesn't have to do the scorpion because he thought it was gross, it's scary, but the rest of it I did, and then. I wanted to drop, the, and I did drop, it was me on the harness, like the, the huge drop, if you see, I don't know, I'm just talking like you've all seen the movie, I don't even know if you have. Um, so I did some of the drop, but not the whole drop, because they didn't, they didn't have me insured for it. So I did the let it go stuff, and then they had a, a stuntman do, or woman, I can't remember. The, the one that burnt up was a guy. Um, and then I, they dropped me from a pretty good height, and I, and I landed. But it wasn't to my liking because I wanted to do that. <laughs> they had a big um, tramp, not a trampoline, but one of those big, you know how they put things under when somebody's going to jump? Mm -hmm. They had one of those. Yeah, but you can't shoot it. So I, even, even if I'd done that entire drop myself, I still, you couldn't have shot it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the landing has to be movie magic. <clears throat> Chopping Mall seems to find a new audience with each generation. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that film has such staying power? I don't know. You guys have no idea the crap that I took for making that movie. <laughs> oh my god. I had, an, I had made with an agent and she said, she looked at my resume and she goes, Chopping Mall? And she's like busted out laughing. And That was basically the reaction I would get. And, you know, it was, it was embarrassing. Well, back in the day, you have to remember that horror was something to be ashamed of. It wasn't cool like it is now. Um, it was like, oh, you did horror movies? And that's like a real, you know. Like they asked George Clooney, like, why did you do Attack of the Killer Tomatoes? And he said, because I had to pay my rent. Yeah. But that, that was the, it was looked down upon, not like now. Um, so I took a bunch of crap for that. And then um, all of a sudden, it, it just keeps coming around and coming around. and. And all of a sudden, people are not making fun of it anymore, you know? Right. Or, or, or if they do, it's with affection. And I just, it, it's unbelievable to me that I have Chopping Mall Blu-rays sitting on my table, and that was like 1986, and people still love it. It's, it's, uh, well, Barbara was telling the story too. She went to, you know, she moved up upstate, and she had a family, and when she started meeting people in the business again, so she was interviewed by somebody, he brought up Chopping Mall, and, and she was still back in the day in her mind, so she said, why would you bring that horrible thing up? And he said, horrible thing? Don't you know that you're a big star? And I didn't know it either. That, no, we didn't realize people were watching this stuff until the internet. Yeah, we had no idea. We had no idea until people started, you, you know, you might want to go on the internet. It's like, oh my God. You know, I, we had no idea. You said you, you did all your stunts except for one you didn't break glass? I didn't, I didn't break the glass because I didn't want me to get I cut. I unintentional. Ask him. <laughs> well, it hurts. And plus you can't... I cut myself. Because we, you can't, uh, like, you could be doing that scene and then a scene in the beginning and, you know, if I had my face ripped open, that... Oh, jeez. Well, yeah, so. didn't turn off. <laughs> we were supposed to leave behind. Classes, uh, he's the director, and I was out standing behind this glass. It, it gave him, I thought it was plexiglass, it was real glass, and all of a sudden, like this just went right through it. I nicked it right there. You could have lost your arm. Really? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, <laughs> kept the roll. Kept, kept, kept Absolutely. Roll. Hey, that looks good. Let's yeah. keep that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real well, it's it's cool. well, let's improvise. I was like, okay, <laughs> got the hand out the glass on the field, go out the camera. That's why you always, you never break the scene until they say that, because you never know what they're getting. <laughs> Might be worth it. Uh, so you were uh, on an episode of True Blood. Uh -huh. Talk about that experience. Well, that was, okay, that was really cool. Because um, um, Alan Ball, I'm a fan of Alan Ball's, and he was a, he's a fan of horror movies. And so um, he, he called me in to do this thing. Now, they do something that they that they don't do anymore, I mean, that they didn't used to do, which is, they'll tell you that you're going on as a recurring role, 
And you may or may not be, I'm not saying they're lying, but they keep their options open. So I thought I would have a recurring role on that thing as the evangelist. And then, I mean, they shot pictures of us, like, you know, and all that stuff. Then they decided that, you know, actually the Fellowship of the Sun didn't really work out because, you know, born-again Christians versus vampires, who's going to win? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not really that one. So they, you know, they, they didn't really take that story like how they wanted to do it. Um, so I just did the one. But it was, it was, Alan Ball, I think, is amazing. And he, he was, I don't know, he, he came in and said, I'm going to direct that scene myself. And, and I was, wow. That was really cool. And the guy who was playing my husband, I didn't know who I was supposed to be because this woman has since passed away because they didn't want to show me the picture that they were working off of. And they showed me after, they said, we don't want to show you this because we don't want you to freak out. There was a real evangelist and she was, she kind of had the pink hair and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of her name right now. I, don't you get, usually somebody knows who it is. Um, I remember. Yeah, that's the person I was supposed to be. No, no, more recent than that. But um, he was supposed to be like Jim Baker. He said, just, just be drunk. That was his whole note. Be drunk. <laughs> but the whole reason we were there is to introduce that character that came in. Right. Yeah. So you've done a lot of TV and film. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a lot of differences between the two, and do you prefer one over the other? Um, the schedule is different, and um, mm -hmm. I think the medium is a little bit, TV is a little bit more intimate, actually. Although, I, mean, I can't really say that because Cameras that they in right like this, you know, and normally they don't really do that on television as much. Um, but it just feels more um, accessible. Um, but I, I can't really say that because, you know, when you're watching on a, on a big screen on film and it's way more moving than watching a TV show. So I don't even know what I'm trying to say. I, I like both. Um, I start out in television and I like the pressure of television. Because um, you still you have to do it, so you don't have time to freak out about it. You just have to do it. Um, but I like I like film because it's um, it's what I wanted to do in the first place. I want to be D Betty Davis, you know. So when I was on TV, I was like, I want to be in the movies. Little did I know, and we didn't know any, and everything is flip flop completely. When I in the '80s, you didn't want to do television if you were already doing movies because it was a step down. I mean, think about all the money these people are making, and film actors are like, it's a step down. <laughs> now all these people are like killing each other trying to get on Netflix. <laughs> and everything is different. Everything is flip-flop from what it used to be. It used to be if, if you're on the soaps, you'd never, ever, ever get a chance to do a movie. Just breaking from a soap opera to a movie was a, like a miracle. I know, I know. Now we have James Franco goes on General Hospital for fun. Ever been on stage? Oh yes, many times. I started at the Guthrie Theater. I wanted to be a classic. I wanted to be, you know, just do like Shakespeare and then really let my hair down and do some Chekhov. Uh, <laughs> that didn't work out. You want to hear God laugh? Tell me your plans. That's what I was doing in New York. when I got this film is I was going to conservatory school, trying to catch up because a lot of these kids had, you know, their whole life they've been doing this, and I was just, I was fresh compared to them as starting like old to be doing this. And so I was really, you know, sweating blood, like trying to catch up with them. And I just so happened to get a soap opera. And I was scared to tell the, the teacher because I thought he was going to be, you know, how could you do that? What a piece of trash. And he said, what are you talking about? He said, you got a job. That's the whole point. And I went, it is? <laughs> Well, he could have said that in the first place. <laughs> but it just was such a shocking insight to me, you know, to, to think that, oh, everything had to be, I mean, it's, as a matter of fact, it really kind of hurt me for a while because I had, the, the, the acting and stuff was such a religion to me that I was almost taking it, like, too seriously and couldn't really, like, just, um, and then I could have saved myself from that. <laughs> So, being in some of the classic horror and comedies, do you find it's easier to scare people or make them laugh? Make them laugh. 
Yeah. It's really hard to scare people. So it's much more challenging. In what way do you think? Mm, um, you think we're more desensitized? I think we are very desensitized, for sure. Right. And I think that I mean, even though we love the catharsis of the, of the horror, there's a natural instinct to, this isn't going to scare me, that you have to break through. You, when you make people laugh, nobody goes, I'm not going to laugh no matter what, except for comedians. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> funny, but they don't laugh. Um, but people, I, I, I know this guy who sits there and picks apart, oh, that doesn't look real. Oh, that doesn't look real. Oh, that would happen. I'm thinking, what are you watching it for then? It's a good point. You know, so I think there's a natural resistance to it, but um, um, like, it depends on what scares you too. Right. Yeah. I mean, sometimes the not, you know, the, the suspense part, like when it's like, don't walk, don't walk down that hall. Don't. You know, that's the anxiety of that is scary. Um, you know, like I watched The Exorcist and I wasn't scared, but then I went home and I was terrified. Mind. And I'm talking about like in the 90s when they re-released it. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, well, I thought, you know, okay, so I, you know, as a, as a film person, and then I was home by myself, and I was terrified. So it, terror, terror can be a delayed reaction, too. This is true. So what have you been working on lately? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm in this movie now called Blowing Up Now, Blowing Up Right Now, and it's a romantic comedy, and I'm playing the guy's mom on Skype. So that's just like a little um, cameo thing that I'm doing. But it's fun because I don't know how to work Skype, so that's that's where the comedy is. Um, and he's trying to get out of town, and we're you know, we're trying to figure out how to get him out of town, and I'm clueless. So that's what's. Um, and then I did a, a short film where I'm an alcoholic cougar. Um, that's doing the festivals now. It's fun some. It's different for me because people don't expect me to be doing, like, oh, I want a comedy festival? You know, um, we got Best Ensemble cast, which is cool. And um, what else did I do? Oh, I got something, there's a premiere next month. It's called um, Well Respected Man. And guess what? It's another apocalypse thing. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Oh, the world is ending. Paul Maroney is. <laughs> And then what else have I got? Oh, I've got this thing called the video store. And it's it's about video stores in the 90s, and I'm the kid's mom. But I'm a cool mom. Um, aliens come to this uh, video store. And it's also interactive. They built an escape room. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, they re 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 recreated a video store. and I, I haven't been to see it yet, but that's a premiere that they're going to have soon anyway. And then I did a um, um, HP Love, Lovecraft adaptation called um, The Old Ones, and that's a really fun part for me. It's not very glamorous at all. <laughs> um, but, um, that'll be out soon, I guess, because it's going to go to an HP Lovecraft festival. I've always wanted to do that, being a real classic, iconic horror thing. So that was fun for me. And what else? Oh, it's just something I'm waiting on to see. You know, you never know if these things are going to get their money or not, so you don't mention them because then if it doesn't end up happening, then you look like the boy who cried wolf. So I don't say anything until I know for sure. Right. So does anybody have any questions? Background, I'm just really good at that. I love it. Oh my well, gosh. Well, you see me tomorrow. I love it. Well, that's, here's, I mean, speaking of, Parts like Jennifer Jason Lee, I auditioned for that, I didn't get it, I ended up to cheer there. So Heather Lankenkamp and I, she auditioned for Night of the Comet, she didn't get it. I auditioned for her part in Nightmare on Elm Street, and I didn't get it. So she got the franchise, that's what sucks for me. <laughs> but, yeah, so I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of weird things that were happening during that time. Like, we didn't know that, there's a, there, I have a nightmare stuff in Night of the Comet, we didn't know that, the, that they were all, we didn't know what they were doing. So. Um, and then also, uh, Robert England says to me and Catherine Mary Stewart at a convention, he goes, don't you guys remember me? It's Robert England, you know, he's like the most uh, charismatic, energetic person in the world. And I thought, how could I have met him and not remember him? He goes, red afro? And I did kind of remember this guy with a red afro. He goes, yeah, every time I audition for something, you guys would walk in. But he had a, you know, is he a guy and he had a red afro. 
Afra. And then I did remember him. So it, it was a weird, it was more, um, it was more of a community thing now. I mean, I don't know what it's like to be a young actor in town, but I suspect that it's not the, not the community kind of thing that it is now. That, that, I mean, yeah, that, that it was. I, I think it's different now. Well, first of all, there's all the self-tapes, so you don't really, you send in your self-tape, and then there's not that thing where you all have to end up in the same room at some point, waiting to read and stuff like that. Although, I, you know, I just hear that it's different. I mean, I hear that, um, we used to laugh our butts off if something went wrong or something that's not allowed anymore. They're very, very serious. And you get, I mean, especially on, on network television, you can get fired for that. Unless you're the, the lead or something. But you better not like, have one misstep. And I heard this from somebody who's a stand-in, so I don't know if it's like that across the board, but um, it sounded really ten really uh, um, anxiety-producing. And I don't remember it being that way. It was fun, you know? Yeah, I, <coughs> I live in California from 1986 to 2014. <coughs> and I ended up going to a comic and somebody told me what comic I was like. I didn't believe it. They said, you got an actor sitting right there at the table, you can walk. I said, no, that can't be true. Mm -hmm. So I got in there, walked in, and you were the first person I saw. I really? I think it was 92 or 3. Oh, and I walked right up, and I said, oh, my God, tell them around me. I said, I just watched you in Chopping Ball two days ago. <laughs> and you said, oh, God, that movie. Right? I, said, I said, I liked it. I thought it was good. And then I got a part of a picture. Those were it. still the days when I was taking a beating for doing yeah, that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so I uh, would try to go to Comic-Con every year now. And, uh, Ken Faree was sitting right next uh -huh. to me. And uh, a whole lot of, I couldn't believe all the celebrities there. And uh, I go over here now. Since I'm back here, I go to Steel City Con every four months. And it's the same thing. You got a lot of great actors sitting right there. I mean, I walked right up to Ned Campbell there, you know, the last one. And I'm like, how is there nobody in your line? And when she had gone to a, one of those panels, and they hadn't announced she was back then. I didn't know how get there first. Well, sometimes it'd be somebody who you'd think ought to have a line or something, but they, they're new to conventions, and so they don't have the banner and all that stuff. They got a little piece of paper with their name in ballpoint pen taped up behind them. Nobody, they go, this is, this is nobody's got, you know, it's, nobody knows they're there, and they don't. You know, you gotta, it's a whole culture, and it, it didn't used to be. So now it's like a the convention thing is a whole thing, and it, it wasn't before. So, um, I'm still saying con when they have a case like that, the announcer will go, so-and-so is in his booth, he was in this, and he was in that, and he's in this, right? And then people will get an idea of who they're talking about. That's a new one because they, yeah. they they would announce things, but they wouldn't announce what their um, what their movies were. Because yeah. sometimes you don't know a person's name; you just know what what movie they're from and what they played. But if you just say somebody's name, they wouldn't necessarily know. So that's really smart, and they should take that up in Los Angeles. <laughs> they don't do that yet. Kelly Maroney, chopping ball. Exactly. Yeah. They're gonna go, who? Oh yeah, and I don't know. Ball. Oh yeah. Oh, I was like a little kid at Christmas, really, mm -hmm. and I was forty. Years old, and I'm walking around. Oh my God! Oh my God! You know, I've come down a little since then, but not a lot. It's, it's fun for us because we get to see each other, and we never do. Yeah. You know, and I meet people all the time that impress me that I would never otherwise run into or anything like that. I mean, we have a certain amount of fan girl stuff that we do too. Like one time, um, um, Dick Van Dyke came through to buy. He's heavily into Halloween. He came through to um, Montepalooza to buy some Halloween stuff. And he just walked in like a regular person, and Catherine Mary Stewart and I were like, that's Dick Van Dyke. And we were so starstruck, let's ask him for a picture. <laughs> and it was really funny. So we're, we're the fangirls in that case. And he was very nice to us, but I'm sure that he thought twice before, because I think everybody did it to him. Yeah. Uh, James Lipton on Inside the Actor Studio always talks about his time as a soap opera actor. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn specifically as a soap opera actor? You, you talked about TV and the pressure, but Everything. that was very early on in your career. That was my first job. Yeah, I learned everything from that because every day I went to work and the only 
The only way you learn anything is by doing it all the time. And I could have spent 10 years in school and not learned as much as I did doing that soap. You know, I mean, you got to, I didn't know the cameras, I didn't know how to cry on cue, I didn't, I didn't really understand anything. Because had I gone through normal school, I mean, you still have to do that. And then they just threw me on national television and said, figure it out or go home. One of the two. And I was going to be damned if I got fired. So I learned as fast as I could. That would have been so humiliating, you know, to get this huge break and then not be able to cut it. Um, and the woman who played my mom was like very, very kind to me. And she could have had me for breakfast, but instead she taught me how to play a bitch. But she didn't have to do that. <laughs> Any last questions? Sure. Did you have more fun doing shopping more or uh, made the comment? Um, and the comment. Yeah. Um, it was so weird. It was one time when we're shooting at the mall. You know, I had my rollers in and a bathrobe, and it's time for lunch. And we're down in like the worst part of, of Los Angeles, downtown. And the homeless people started getting in line with us, and so they just fed them. They hadn't went enough. <laughs> Stuff like that would happen all the time. It was wonderful. And, and also because I didn't know Los Angeles yet, I mean, they go, okay, you're, I don't know if you guys know in Los Angeles or not, but they go, okay, we're going to be in Oxnard. And I go, Oxnard? <laughs> they go, oh, yeah, she's not from here. I didn't know anybody. And so to me, it was kind of like Night of the Comet. Those were the only people I knew. You know, I got really, really, really hunkered in there. And I loved the part, and I just, I just, uh, I don't know, I put my heart and soul into that. I, did, I did tried to do that with everything, too, but that particular part, because they had us stopping and talking, you know, it was a relationship. Um, it's, le it's, it's less uh, easy to do that when it's mostly action and you're running around, although you better find those moments, you know, otherwise, who cares? Um, I think you already said this, but in shopping, did you have problems with the robots always breaking down? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. only one of them, they all did different things. Only one of them really um, was the most functional. Yeah, there's, there's always like in Star Wars, every time R2D2 or the others, they always break down. Mm -hmm. with that. It makes for good outtakes, but we don't have any outtakes. Everyone goes, well, so where are the outtakes for that? And that, you know, every second of that that we shot, is on that screen. Every dime we had is on that screen. There's no such thing as stuff we just throw away. <laughs> yeah, all the film was mm -hmm. expensive. It was different. Right. And that made, that made, what, three times the money back or something. At least, oh yeah, yeah. at least. In fact, um, 1984, of course they wanted to get that in while it was still 1984 in the fall, so um, even though none of the comment was doing well, they pulled it to put in 1984, never dreaming that None of the comet was going to be more successful than that one. They just thought, this is, you know, let's pull this little thing, who cares? Yeah, it's crazy, you never know, like you said earlier. You never, you never know. know what's going to hit. It's like going to Vegas. <laughs> well, Kelly, thank you for taking some time. It's thank been great you. chatting with you. It's been great chatting with you, too. And everybody thank go you. Uh, check her out at the table, get an autograph, and uh, put your hands together. for. <laughs>